Are we there yet? No, we're not. <laughs> You're too early. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think anyone's complaining. Whatever, it's gonna have a live where all we are doing something after this. Uh, after the panel, yeah. So if you guys want to take note, uh, Mark has a booth uh, in the small press area, number 36. He's there all weekend, uh, and it looks like he's gonna also be on the panel on Sunday at 11 a.m. So totes check him out. Surprise, I'm also on a panel tomorrow morning at 10. <laughs> that I just found out yesterday. <laughs> so, regardless, I'm glad you guys are here. I think this will be a fun conversation with all of these amazing people. And yes, now, I think truly no, now. <laughs> There's no rush to come to me. <laughs> all right, hi everyone. My name is Lynn Pacificar. I am a Katura, a Visayan shaman. Um, if you don't know what the Visayan is, it's a, a place in the Philippines in the western Visayas area. So there's always a, a misconception that every Filipino is the same. Well, we're a 7,000 island archipelago of multicultural peoples. And so my ancestors stand with the western Visayas and the eastern Visayas region of the Philippines, as well as some parts of Luzon. So I want to acknowledge them as well. I'm also the CEO founder of Herbalaria, which is a company founded on our traditional Filipino healing, as well as creating the medicines and um, teaching our community the various ways of healing ourselves in order to heal our ancestors and the generations after. So um, the question, which is, <laughs> what does gaming have to do with anything? Um, it helps our mental health. So let me go back to a time where I was, I'm an RPG player. So anybody here RPG? Okay. Anybody here? <laughs> Everybody RPG? Um, I'm not really a first person player because I get dizzy. Um, anybody else get dizzy with first person players? Uh, yeah, can't do it. Um, my The game that I really turned to and really uh, looked up to was Diablo and uh, my character was the sorceress. And during the time, I was going through a lot of, let's just say identity, disempowerment, um, I was in an abusive relationship, and um, Diablo really was the medium for me to feel empowered through my character, the sorceress, because she really reminded me of my own powers, my own ways of manifesting what I wished for in my own life and controlling the elements and, and being able to cast spells and all that stuff was really resonating with something that is deeply written into my DNA because we have actual healers and um, I don't know how to say spell casters in my family, but in the Philippines we have traditional like Magamots and like I'm a Katuuran, and we have Abulario, so different titles for people who are folk medicine practitioners who really believe in the magic and the spiritual element. And so when I played Diablo, it was a way for me to build my own armor, especially against someone who was abusive mentally to me. And um, and that's just one game I was playing at the time. And the other time that I really appreciated, I don't know if anybody knows Pandora's Box. Did anybody play Pandora's Box? It was one of the best uh, puzzle games that came out um, from Microsoft. It was also created by the, the one who created Tetris, which is uh, Alexei Pajidnov. And so um, playing t uh, something like Pandora's Box really helped me figure things out, you know, and because you had to get the tricksters to get back in the box, it was just, it was almost like I was in another world. It was very much like we, we brought up this word escapism. And in the, in the realm of mental health, a lot of what, like, as, especially me, I'm also someone who went through depression. So um, I don't know who here has also been through severe depression or anxiety, ADHD, I've suffered all that and I attribute that type of, of inspiration to going into another world as a way of helping me find my way back into this realm and really empowering me 
to believe in myself again, to create my own spells, to be magical and be empowered with knowing who I truly am. So this is where I believe that games have really supported my mental health, but also empowerment so that I can be a better example, not only for my community, but to my own children. It's really amazing. And I, I actually, I have heard a lot about Pandora's box um, before I had a, a friend that played it. And they actually were saying a lot of similar things that you know, helped them identify a lot of different pieces of themselves through all the different like tricks you have to get in. So yep. that's really amazing. Um, so we're going to move from representation to the actual psychological value that these games can hold uh, for the players and for their communities, for their families. Uh, we have these two presenters, Dr. Rodin and Dr. Sanchez. Let's start with Dr. Rodin. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And I will talk about why video games are actually positive. Because how many of you guys have listened to video games make you addicted? Video games are just capism. Video games are bad. Video games are evil. Video games, bleh. anybody? Yeah. Right. How many of you have heard that actually video games help for anxiety? It teaches you biofeedback, which means how to breathe and calm your nervous system. Also, it helps for uh, neurodiversity. What do I mean? Somebody that has attention deficit disorder versus somebody that has autism or somebody that has dyslexia can learn many skills through video games. Why? Because video games teach you hope. What? Hope? No way. How? Because what did they tell you in the school? They tell you, oh, you're so pretty, you're so smart, you're so this. So they are basing it in something that is subjective. Versus when you go in an active shooter, sorry, uh, first, <laughs> first month, like go like, ah, like Halo or like Call of Duty, like you are like learning a skill there. It's dead a lot, right? Or when you are combating some kind of zombies, it's like, are you a friend or you are gonna eat? Like, let's figure out this out, right? So in there, you go from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.1 person to like 1 million beating the game. That teach you hope and that teach you skills and resiliency, something that we don't learn in the classroom. Because in classroom, we just like ABCs, meaning to pass a test. In video games, we learn to internalize something that we have such as depression. Um, I work with active duty, first responders, and law enforcement, and what I use is VR, meaning, uh, you know, like not to go in which one is better versus another, but it, uh, virtual reality, I can teach them to go and calm their nervous system doing the whole active duty kind of stuff, you know, going to war in a very controlled environment. That way the PTSD symptoms can reduce. I also utilize video games with something called EMDR, which is bilateral stimulation. And guess what do I use? I use the old game from the, I'm gonna age myself from the totally 80s, that is <laughs> in the Twitch. And that helps me to process again a very, very traumatic memory, but they're entertained going and they don't enter in a panic. Also, I teach them with, how many of you, if you have VR, have played the plank? That all of them really, yes. Don't you love when people are like, <laughs> right? So I said, it's okay, let's breathe, let's do this. So, VR is one of the things I utilize in my in private practice to help with symptoms of PTSD. For children, I help them to communicate and actually learn tools to uh, manage their depression, their anxiety, because they don't have the vocabulary to say, hey, I'm hurting. But they can tell you with a little Tetris, like, I'm going to destroy this, or um, teaching them the same value of uh, Cross animals, how many of you have played in that one? And also, my dissertation was in the positive effects of video games. So if you scan the QR code, I, whoever signs up, I will send you the whole list of video games that are actually proven to help you for specific things. For example, Grease is one that helps you with grief. Grease is a brand new video game that I highly recommend that just have it in your collection because it's amazing. Uh, every room and every rim that you go through, it will change every time that you play it. 
because depending on the level of grief that you have, you will see the video game differently. That's amazing. Yeah, so everyone check out the scan code. You can get a good list of video games that can be beneficial for a lot of things. Um, I know when I was doing my dissertation, I came across a lot of articles about use of video games in treatment, specifically for PTSD and uh, ADHD. Um, there actually is a FDA-approved video game treatment for ADHD called Endeavor RX. Um, when I was working with children, I talked to uh, the parents about that because the kid is really struggling with impulse control and like focus and everything, and this game is designed to help with that. Uh, and it's an FDA approved video game. Like it's prescribed only, like you can't just buy it from the store. The doctor needs to prescribe a video game. It was amazing when I learned about it. Um, and it really did help the, the, my client a lot in impulse control issues, task focus, uh, task completion. So yeah. I find that really great. In, in the next slide, you will see all the things. The reason why I put those pictures in there is like for you guys to understand that we can be anything and everything, right? I was a geek, a cosplayer, and I'm also an immigrant, uh, half Mayan, half Spanish, so I have part of the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, and then I create a, a community where everybody is accepted no matter where you are. And guess what? We play a lot. Uh, and they always tell me, no, but video games are bad. I was like, no, actually, they're really good to assess if you're depressed or not, or if you're uh, actually are really, really good for anger, because instead of going to scream to your dog, to your person, to your loved one, you go and just go to active, to Call of Duty or Halo and just Or if you have played Zelda, how many find Zelda so oh. Right? Did you know that the music of Zelda is actually designed to calm your nervous system? And if you ever want to complete a task like this, Put Mario Bro Mario Bros um, music like do, 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 and you finish your essay and whatever you have to do oh in less time. I dare you to try. You know what? I am totally using this. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you tell me about this before when I was working on my dissertation? Now I'm already done with it. All right. Let's go to Dr. Sanchez Arisa. Hello, everyone. I. Uh, I said yes when I got the invite uh, to be a part of this panel, and then I panicked because I was like, I'm not a gamer, why am I even here? Um, and I had multiple conversations with uh, Dr. Gameology <laughs> at the end about how I'm not ready for video games, I don't know anything about video games, they're too difficult, and then I had to stop and think about what I consider to be gamers. Like, so what are some of the characteristics, you guys? Like, just shout them out. Like, uh, what's the stereotypical gamer? Someone who's hyper focused on something. Someone who's like a player, right? Playing video games. Someone who's good at them. <laughs> yes, which I do not have. <laughs> uh, but then I realized that pretty much every day I play on my phone. And that helps me like unwind from the day. And it's like this like no brainer game where I just have to like plant crops and pick them up. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> like I just don't have to think about it. And then um, my sibling who's the one sort of like responsible for introducing me to pretty much anything that's geeky and nerdy, um, he loves, he was my idea of what a gamer was. Like he was on the computer, he had like, you know, several devices where he played games and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing with the buttons, so I just press everything um, and, so, and, so, and hopefully something worked. Um, but, okay, so the, what I wanted to talk about is community. You mentioned like how there is like a community and then so I didn't feel like I would I belong I belong in that community because I wasn't a gamer. I wasn't playing those like games like him. Like I have no idea. I never really seen anybody play anything like that. Um, and then I feel like I'm not up to that level uh, of trying video games. But then I realized that that's the beauty of video games, right? There's video games for everything and everyone. Um, and everybody can be considered uh, a gamer. Um, it doesn't matter if you're playing like Animal Crossing or like, you know, uh, 
uh, phone games at the end of the day, but they're actually very helpful. Like you talked a lot about how it helps anxiety and PTSD, and I, I have examples of like my own personal life. I hate spiders, guys. Mm -hmm. It just I hate them. But then I started playing Lego um, uh, in Fortnite, and uh, I was like. Now I'm ready to kill the spiders. Because that <laughs> gave me courage. Like, I was like, no. At first I was so scared and I just kept trying and trying. And then it's just like those little things. Like, it was like a week of me playing, not saying that my fear completely went away, but now I'm prepared to actually do something about that fear uh, when I see a spider. Because before my to go was like, dad, sibling, someone else, please help. Because <laughs> I'm not going anywhere near there. Um, but there's like, little things like that that video games can help us and having that community or just like hanging around with friends like i don't think we have this anymore but i used to hear about land parties oh, where people used to play like do we have that now they're still around everything's online you can do it if you want to yeah i mean that's the beauty of technology right like where we are able to to use that to connect with other people and they're like we're able to have like it's like a completely different language right like you were talking about video games and i'm like okay i'm not very familiar with the language quite yet but being a part of that community it's it's a safe space for us so where we can just go and like turn off our brain and then just, just play. There's no consequences whether, you know, you beat the boss or you don't. Uh, I mean, you might be upset about it. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a safe space for us to be and to try new things, right? I tried getting closer to the players through the video game and somehow that worked Yeah, for real life. So it's like little things like that that can help us. And I just really dislike the misconception that everybody has about you know video games being bad and that's not true and so my main goal I have a nonprofit organization you could flip to the yes um, so I created a nonprofit organization where we are trying to geekify our communities essentially uh, because I talk to a lot of parents I work a lot with kiddos and um, a lot of parents are like uh, well you know video games are not good one and uh, I, I don't want my kid to be playing video games and I'm like but that's their safe space that's how they regulate themselves that's how they you know they feel safe um, and they, they learn a lot through video games not only about like how to use technology but a bunch of other things about mental health and stuff just parents are not aware and um, sometimes when I talk to parents they say uh, I ask them about their hobbies and they don't have any because they may parenting being their full-time job so they don't have any time and I'm like well you need to take care of your mental health as well parents also need to get, take care of their mental health so you know playing video games with your kiddos that's great for you for them and for the family and just for everyone as a whole so we're trying to encourage everyone just to to geek out really and whatever video game you're into whatever fandom uh, you love just geek out I think that's really amazing. And what you were saying about how the parents can play with their kids, well, I, a lot of parents that I worked with felt like they couldn't connect with teenage, their teenage children. I mean, people here might have that idea that teenagers are really hard to connect with because they're very moody, understandable, but if they're playing this video game, this is something that they like, maybe just sit next to them while they're playing and just like ask them, oh, what's going on? What, what's this game about? Tell me what you like about it. You don't need to be the expert in the game. You don't need to I even understand everything that they're telling you, but the fact that you're showing an interest helps the, the child, the teenager, be more open about themselves and about what they care about. Um, so that's something that I was encouraging a lot of the parents of my clients to do, was just like at least one night a week. If, you're, if your teenager is playing a video game, just sit next to them and like watch them and talk to them about it. Um, even if it's just for five minutes, even if that's all you can stand, at least you're showing the, the, your child that you care about them and their interests. Um, and then going back to the community, there's a lot of those like phone games like Animal Crossing and like Angry Birds. Those are video games too that the whole world plays, but people don't consider that gaming, but it is. And people talk about it and create some new communities because they're playing with their friends online and they're you know throwing pigs at each other and whatnot. So don't throw swine for love. 
<laughs> All right, so there is um, a therapy conference. This is a professional conference, guys, where a bunch of therapists will talk about gaming and geek stuff. Uh, this year is April 19th through 21st. Um, you can get tickets to watch it. These are all online, it's all virtual. Uh, if anyone in the audience is a therapist themselves and wants CEs, you can get CEs from attending a talk about games. Like, that's amazing. Um, but this is a new area for therapists and clinicians and teachers to explore the use of these kinds of environments and games for their work. Um, and so I'm going to move this along to our last two people down the line there, so far away from me. Makes me sad. Um, I'm going to let them talk about the online community value that can be found with video games. Let's start with Brooke. Hi, I'm Brooke. Um, I'm a therapist and I'm the fellow people I'm with as doctors and stuff, but I definitely feel a piece of what they all said. Like, I just learned why I loved always picking a sorceress and Diablo and mental or and video games truly did save my life. And I play video games with my son every week. And I also learned why I get so much done when my son's playing Mario Party. I, I understand entirely now why that works. <laughs> um, I grew up with a Nintendo 64, but that was kind of the only video game system I had. Other than that, I was not allowed to play video games at all. So in the sense of feeling like you kind of don't belong because, you know, the gaming thing. Like, I would play Solitaire, good old Solitaire, because so I was not young. You didn't have a computer back then or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but I loved Mario Party, and then uh, fast forward quite a bit. I fell in love with Diablo, and I cannot walk and look. I get stuck in the corner, so controllers, first person, not a thing whatsoever. So I fell in love with Diablo. And then um, I got a gaming PC, I built it, I randomly decided to start Twitch streaming, playing Diablo, and then I was like, you know, I'm gonna try to learn how to play Call of Duty. Like, I'm pretty good on mouse and key. Like, I can figure it out, right? Well, I learned on my Twitch stream how to play Call of Duty, and in doing so, I met my best friend, who is now family. My son knows her as Auntie Harry, because her game is, her gamer tag is Harry. Um, we don't even call her Kate, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, and throughout that process, my community, like I was able to form this safe space, this community of no matter who you were, what you did, how your day went, it, you could just be there and just hang out with us and laugh and be goofy. And in doing that, I found my own voice and saved, entirely saved my life and changed my life. And it was solely because my community was there and it was such an empowerful, incredible thing. And I created a mental health project called the Pinky Promise Project um, as of December last year, right before the end of the year. It's in all 50 states and three other countries. Um, has almost two million views on TikTok, the hash, like the hashtag P Promise Project, and um, it's like, ugh, words are hard, sorry. This is my first time speaking, I'm really nervous. <laughs> wait, wait. You're doing great. <laughs> I know what's the Pinky Promise. Um, so it's the concept of moving forward through every sunrise and every sunset, no matter how high the high or how low the low. So um, beginning of 2022, I was at the absolute lowest point in my life and my Twitch community was there for me every single day, no matter how heavy my tears were, no matter what my mood was, even if I said, you know what guys, I'm sorry, like I just can't stream today, like we're just not gonna do I'm gonna end stream. They just, they were there for me, even though I was supposed to be there for them to pull them out of their heart days. Like it is just such, such a big thing. And um, one of my mods from my community reached out to me and was like, hey, like this is where my head is. I'm um, idealizing and like I, I'm, I'm done. You know, I am right there with you, and like, I'm, I'm gonna think of something at the time. I made merch for my own stream, so I already had my own business. I made stickers. Mental health has always been something I've thought of ADHD, anxiety, depression, I have an eating disorder. Like, the list just. Um, so, I've thought of all of that, not actually acknowledging it and putting a name to it, and just kind of being like the weird outsider and never really feeling like I belonged anywhere. So, then being able to create this community of like, no matter who you are, like, you are welcome here. I got wide open arms, like, come on in, let's go. <laughs> um, so I thought of 
the pinky promise. It's like, hey, like pinky promised me this, and it was a thread of text messages, and uh, I was able to pinky promise me, like, we're gonna keep doing this. Like, I am right here with you, but we're not gonna stop. And she was like, I can't pinky promise that. You know, I don't know if I won't break it. And I was like, that's the whole point of a pinky promise. And then I'm a graphic designer, so I drew up some skeleton hands, and I slapped it on a sweater, and I mailed it to her, and I was like, all right, I have a platform, and I was, um, posting some TikToks that were getting like pretty big views, pretty growing exponentially, and I was like, I have a platform that I can help people, and that's what I decided to do. And it all started because I got into video games. And now we present a wonder con. This is just the first of many cons. <laughs> first, first con, first talking. It's been absolutely incredible. I have never felt so out of place, looking so normal, and it was such an incredible <laughs> feeling that I'm going to hold on to forever. Like, I have never felt so out of place looking so normal, and I was like, I just, just like embodied it, and I absolutely love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the of cons, right? I know, I'm so disappointed. I'm like, next year, I'm going full out, head to toe. I'm going hard in the paint. So here's a, a, a scan code for oh. Brooks. Uh, work. Yeah, it's, uh, so that'll take you to. It's called Milkshake, um, but it has all of my links. So my store, I make <laughs> shirts. I do Einstein. I go live while I do it. Uh, the Pinky Promise Project is on there. Info about it. I also created um, a daily journal, a guided daily journal for the Promise of Purpose. Promise of Purpose. It's on Amazon. The link for that. All of that's from that store. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Kaufman, but then I force my students to learn very quickly that I'm Dr. Gameology. So uh, when people call me Daniel, I get to say that name no longer has any meaning for me. Um, but what, what Dr. Gameology is, is this whole idea that uh, I teach online classes. And I think back through my career, I'm a licensed mental health counselor and I have a doctor in counselor education and supervision. And I've done a lot of work as a counselor working with clients, and not a lot of it at, for the first 10 years was about video games. But I started to notice that some of the most effective sessions that I would have with clients where they get excited to come back and tell me about what they did, and the metaphors that work were all having to do with video games. Um, I, you know, I convinced a, a teenager that yeah, you're taking the trash out like your mom asked, but your attitude's pretty sucky, your attention to detail's bad, so if this was a devil may cry combo, you'd be getting a D. <laughs> and like, we want you to do the version of taking the trash out with a good attitude and get smoking sexy style. <laughs> and we never ended up having to talk about the trash ever again because you just started doing it right. Um, talking with, you know, uh, a, a young adult, you know, to me as a kid, but young adult um, that was on the verge of getting fired because of just handling conversations and tact wrong at their job. I think it was Staples or Office Max or something. And he was playing The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt when that was new. And I was like, if you were Geralt and you were picking those conversation choices, what do you think would happen? We'd fight, like someone's head's rolling. It's like, yeah, you can't do that in the real world. You get fired. So, you know, maybe next time you play The Witcher, think about yourself and how would I handle this from a customer service perspective? <laughs> and uh, even though he didn't have it in him to do customer service, he was able to get to that point just by realizing that The Witcher is a conversation simulation. And so my research started to look a lot at how does our personality play out in the way we play video games. So I started doing different studies with video games, started out with Star Wars The Old Republic, then switched over to Final Fantasy XIV because it's much more active as a video game and um, looking at people's personality types, looking at how they um, experience relax relaxation in the game, 
and how that differs based on our personality breakdown, like our stat sheet. And so then when I talk with counselors about this, and psychologists, especially psychologists, they just don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, like joy is only something that's measured and not actually a real thing that can be experienced but to a lot of them. So that's, that's my profession now, is to convince people who do similar work that I do uh, to pay attention to video games and understand them and look for opportunities of why they're great. And uh, because everything early in my career, um, we switched from paper charts to electronic charts. The first three places I worked, that was the big project. And uh, every time, so I got, you know, obviously it's easy to do progress notes as a counselor in a on a computer because honestly equipping the right gear in a Final Fantasy game is harder. <laughs> and I would tell the other counselors this and they just look at me like I'm speaking another language, which I realize I am speaking a different language. They don't know how to talk about what I'm saying. <laughs> and uh, so it was, over time I just started to, we can go to the next slide, over time, I started to look at different things in anthropology and mythology, religion and culture and philosophy. I did a conference presentation recently uh, where the person running the event came up to me after I was done and said, we have really big name people all the time do this event, psychologists, people who have published over 10 books. and." you're the first person to do this topic and come at it from a philosophical perspective. You know, doctors of philosophy doesn't mean that you actually speak like a philosopher. So I was like, okay, did you just call me like 500 years old? Or, <laughs> um, so they, they elaborated, what they meant is, you know, talking about what the essence of being who we are. And to me, I think that the thing that I gravitate to the most in terms of the, the question, what am I? And we could say I'm a white male, we could, you know, we could say I speak English, you know, all the, all the default things that kind of indicate you don't understand multiculturalism. Uh, but the thing that I really do stand out and I have a little bit more of, um, I guess of a diverse perspective is that I really am a gamer. That's the group of people that I fit in with the most. And if you're a gamer too, that's where our similarities are. So I wrote this book that looks at uh, how mythology has been used, a lot of stuff from the hero's journey and the monomyth and Joseph Campbell. And the challenge I gave myself, I always, when I read Hero with a Thousand, has anyone in here read Hero with a Thousand Faces? No? Yes? A few people. It, it's about um, how all the stories are the, the same thing, like uh, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, they're all really the same story, just remixed with different main characters in different settings, but it is the same thing, and you know, Tatooine and the Dursleys and Hobbiton are all the same thing. Uh, so that kind of idea. And I, I always thought, why doesn't someone write a book that does that but with video games? And then the pandemic happened, and then I realized, oh, no one's no one's going to do it. I guess I have to do it. Uh, so that that hopefully, is, I mean, that's nearing its final stages. It'll get printed, and people can read it this year. It's not out yet, though. I've been working on it very hard. So, you know. I, my, my goal really is just to help people to understand what games are, how they can be a pathway to succeeding at things in life, um, challenging yourself, but also finding self-care, and uh, how it can be your own mythology to cast yourself as the hero in your own story. There is no Dr. Kaufman who finished a PhD if I had never played, you know, if I never raided in an MMO, if I had never played, uh, I don't know, Final Fantasy VII, probably. Um, so I, I take that and I pass it on to as many people as I can. Thank you.
So, I, before I open up the questions to everyone, I actually would like to ask for each of the panelists to think about one game that they have played, whether it's a you know very mainstream video game or a game on the phone that you felt has helped you connect with yourself more, that made you feel authentic and made you feel whole. So, um, I'll start. I, it's funny, first of all, by the way, Sarah, thank you for inviting us to this panel. And one of the things I like about these different panels is you actually learn more through the conversations and from each other, uh, more so than what you just bring here alone. So, in that being said, one of the things that I realized was there's this video game that I love. It was on the Dreamcast. Who here had a Dreamcast? So, oh, perfect. See, love you guys. Um, Skies of Arcadia was one of my favorite games, and for the longest time, I didn't really understand why, and then I realized today, just now, really, sitting in this panel, why I love that game so much. So, for a lot of people that don't know, um, I was an immigrant, and of course, when you're an immigrant to a new country, I actually moved here by myself at 18. No immediate family. I had to carve my way here. Um, you know, like, for a lot of people, when they look at me and they look at my credentials, they're like, oh, you had it easy. Like, I did not have it easy. Like, that is the furthest from the fact. Yes, I can say now I won this, I did this and did that, but that did not come easy for me. And I think games like Skies of Arcadia um, helped in such a way that it allowed me to dream further than where I was at the time. Like, if you told a kid in a small town that they could become this, you know, somebody in their future, maybe they wouldn't believe that. But in playing something like Skies of Arcadia, where you do take this journey from a kid from a random um, flying cloud somewhere to become the greatest hero in the world, psychologically, that does do something for you. That does kind of allow you to play that journey and see that maybe that could be you as well. So. Yeah, I think to me that is one of my favorites because of that very fact. It allowed me to take that journey. It allowed me to see that no matter the diverse or the adversity, adversity that you experience, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think in a way, I probably utilize that from a both creative and a manifestation energy to despite the challenges of kind of like coming to a new place, kind of like in Skies of Arcadia, moving to a new continent, having to discover everything that you had to discover on your own, you are able to make something out of yourself, which the characters do, if you recall. So, yeah. I think I mentioned all the games that I really <laughs> Like I was supposed to talk about representation <laughs> about me. Um, I, I think I was just excited to even express the fact that um, I think that's the one point in my life I've had to resolve, and, and even my husband knows this, like, video games were, it's a hard point for me because my parents raised me as no video games, and I relate to Brooke. Um, no video games is gonna, in, in our language, if I translate it to English, means your brain will rot. Um, so, I, would go to my cousin's house and play Mario, Super Mario Brothers. And so we, play, we played the early Nintendo systems, the Atari, like I'm really dating myself, right? Um, Duck Hunt was my favorite game. I would go up to the TV and just like, die, duck, die. It's <laughs> like the dog that comes up and laughing at me. I'm sorry, I got pleasure from that. Um, I should not have because that's okay. But you know what? There was maybe there's some psychological <laughs> information to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, and and the peace part when you brought up your friend also talking about Pandora's box. I think the music. So somebody brought up Zelda's music. Pandora's box music is similar to Zelda's music. So when I'm when I was solving puzzles, it really centered me. And he, listening to that music brought me a lot of peace, especially during a time of turmoil. So I invite any of you, if you can get a hold of Pandora's box, like, please try it out. I think it's worth another, like, look at it if you've already done it. But, like, I've, I've looked it up again recently because I was going to come here and talk about it. 
And there are people who actually downloaded it again just because they wanted to play it and, and see if that would feel the same way. And, and you know, a lot of people will say that it was one of the best games, puzzle games that was ever made. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> But it's Racing Evil because, as I said before, I'm from Guatemala, and in Guatemala it was internal war. And in internal war, they play with us as experiments. They did, uh, if you can read the Tuski uh, research, is where they did a lot of uh, research in humans, and those humans were my people. And when I discovered Racing Evil, I came here to the United States as an adult to not speak English, blah, blah, blah my way out, but I was always playing racing people. Why? Because it was a female, female, and a little wild thing, and killing all the zombies, all the things that they were creating. And then uh, I studied neuroscience, and uh, my training from Guatemala is actually in education and music. And my training here in the United States is in Homeland Security and neuroscience. So in one of those neuroscience, uh, Homeland Security programs, I did a training program for um, agencies to, guess what, play with zombies. So uh, we're from San Diego, so in Petco Park, we make it all pretty and stuff, well, evil, and they will play and train as an apocalypse will come. Most followers now, it gets a lot of those people that were training with us, uh, they create these programs and stuff like that that has helped with uh, these importantly pandemics and stuff like that. Why do I bring that? Because not in my wildest dreams I would have been like, I'm playing Raising Evil and that's gonna help me to get grants and get a career. <laughs> not at all. And then music wise, I love Zelda. It's just the music is dreamy. And um, if you um, can just find the score of the original Zelda, you literally just turn the lights off, listen to the thing, and you get transformed to another planet. And those were my two games that uh, saved in many ways my career, my life, and give me revenge, if you will. Uh, so those are mine. Thank you. I'm going to follow all those awesome games. <laughs> Will you like be jeweled? <laughs> early games that I started to play and that's how I realized that I really like those sort of like things like that are organized because 24-7 my ADHD brain is like all over the place and you know creativity and it's all great but also uh, none of it makes sense most of the time if you ever hear me speak. <laughs> I have like four different topics I'm talking about at the same time. Um, and so I didn't realize I had ADHD until I was a, like I don't know, two or three years ago. Um, so now I understand, like looking back, I understand why I really like those games because they're very sort of like simple and like I get to just organize because my brain is not <laughs> organized at all. Um, so it was just easy for me to sort of like unwind and just organize things and just any game that is kind of like Bejeweled, I'm like, but I think it kind of did start with, with that one. That's the one I, I used to play um, during my lunchtime when I was writing my essays for, for, uh, for college and when I was in high school. That's how, that's how it got started for me. That's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I fell in love with D2, or uh, Diablo 2 first, and then I fell in love with Diablo 3, and I totally now realize why? I will process that later. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk. Yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're talking about that later, for sure. That, that's a different panel. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best panel ever. Uh, so I fell in love with D3 um, for that reason, and then honestly, Call of Duty. So even though I couldn't walk and look, and I did not know, like, I couldn't shoot, I couldn't play, I didn't know how to pull up my map, like, I didn't know how to reload, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing most of my time dead spectating my now best friend, Harry. Um, but playing that game, like, I don't know if you guys 
play Call of Duty or I've gone today with them, but they were bringing back Rebirth Island, and um, I got so emotional in hearing that because during the darkest time of my life, when I made P3, um, Rebirth Island was home. Like, that was my safe space, like, dropping in. I was like, you know what? I can defeat any bad guys in my life. And there was a lot of <laughs> nasty stuff's going on in my life. And I was like, nope, any bad guys, like, I'm going after them, and I'm going to freaking win. <laughs> and it was very, very empowering. And then my community around that time too. So Rebirth Island just really felt like home. Like it was truly like a safe place, loading it up, dropping in. I'm like, all right, we're going to tents. Let's go. And guns blazing. So that's, that's my and then yeah, now I play mouse and key and never would have guessed two years ago or three years ago now. <laughs> I could not shoot, play. I was lucky if I even got one kill. Like totally different ball game now. Totally different ball game. <laughs> I don't know how to answer this question <laughs> because there's too many games. Um, I mean, my parents were all over the place in terms of how they viewed video games. On the one hand, it was like, if you finished your homework and did a good job, you can play video games. But then on the other side, it's like, you can't own Pokemon because we think that all 150 of them are demons. <laughs> and so I had to have a sit down conversation in 1998 with diagrams and pictures that I drew that showed that Bulbasaur is a dinosaur with a bulb on his back. <laughs> and bulbs are plants and not demonic in any way. <laughs> And then fast forward 23 years and I wrote the end chapter in the psychology of Pokemon. And I made sure they remembered that sit down conversation on the inside cover of the copy I gave them. And I thanked them for helping me learn at the age of 12 that I need to be able to defend to all the serious adults why I play video games. Uh, so I guess Pokemon's on the list, <laughs> but uh, I, I have to list at least three others. Persona 5 Royal is the game I was playing as my stream game when I changed my online name to Dr. Gameology and started this whole thing. Um, there's also, you know, games that I've done research on, I already mentioned Star Wars The Republic and Final Fantasy XIV, but I think Journey is the game that is most responsible for changing my entire personality. Because I first played it, it, it wasn't new. I think it just came out on PlayStation Plus and was uh, either free or, or cheap uh, when I decided to play it the first time. I was about two or three days away from writing the final pages of my dissertation when I played that game. And everything about it just made me either relive my dissertation in a very positive, victorious way, or realize, I mean, by the time, um, anyone in here played Journey? Okay. Um, well, if you were planning to play Journey, you've had over 10 years, so I'm going to spoil it, kind of. Uh, near the end, you basically almost die or fail, but then all the people that have been boosting you along on the journey show up while you're dying uh, and give you enough energy to fly up the entire mountain and, and have a really triumphant success uh, to, to close the game out. Um, and just because I want to traumatize all of you, it's very similar to Rey getting saved by all the Jedi in The Rise of Skywalker, um, where like you're about to lose and then something miraculous happens. It's from the hero's journey. Uh, journey is just a really beautiful 90 minute thing where you get to live out the stages of the journey. There's no language in it other than the little glyph that you sing with, and uh, if you're lucky, you're playing it at the same time as other people, and it's, it's really neat for socialization. Also, life hack, 
You should always, when you're doing productive work on your computer, be using video game music that has no words, because if it has no words, it will let you enter into a flow state, which is what we keep going back to with the Zelda soundtrack. If I, I mean, if I need 45 minutes of productivity, I have the Journey soundtrack on lock. I've done thousands of hours of work with that music. It has a beginning, middle, and end, and I feel like even if I'm not done with what I was working on, it's okay that I'm not done because I'm done working. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention that like, there is something powerful about like video game music because I haven't played any of those games, but I've listened to the soundtracks. <laughs> so I would like to ask if anyone has any questions. Feel free to stand up so you can be heard. I see some of the hands here. Yeah. So my question is, I've seen a lot of comments saying that if a game gives you hope because you end it and it has like a positive impact, what happens if the game has a negative impact? Let's say a few games like Little Nightmares or Ori, where I hope this is not a spoiler, but, <laughs> but uh, you die. So it is a negative impact if you've played on the game for four or five hours and you're like, why did I do it? Of course, they're amazing games, by the way, but yeah. Uh, do you think if that's something negative or it has a different effect? Because I consider them as great, even though they have a really negative impact at the end. Ah, oh, okay. So, what is wrong with the cycle of life? Right? Also, it teaches you maybe I'm not prepared for this, maybe resiliency, right? Games, pretend, it, it's like playing pretend. What we did when we were kids, we played pretend. We played that we were dogs, we played that we were the teacher, we played that we were the teenager. Sometimes we played we were the bad guy and the good guy, right? So video games are not good or bad. The consequences of playing certain video games has to do more with types of personality that we already possess. When you were asking that question, I also thought about like it, video games can potentially bring up trauma or something. And it's, that's not necessarily bad, but it's hinting at maybe this is something you need to like address with a you know a mental health professional. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. And then we'll go to you afterwards. I had a question about community. Game. So I've always had a hard time trying to find a community outside, right? Whether or not, because I'm, I'm a dual citizen, Canadian American, so I never really know. Like, oh, I come here, oh, you're Canadian. I go to Canada, oh, you're American, right? So it's always double sided. But a lot of times, like, my mom was like, yeah, when you're gaming, you're just in room, you're not going to accomplish anything. So I was just curious when you're playing a game, or if there's a type of game that can help you socialize with people in a way where you become accepted, where you find that level of I like MMO games because you can find a guild and you can drag people into activities with you. And if it's a good guild for that, then there's people that are, you know, playing all different kinds of schedules and some of them just have done everything so many times they just like helping people. Uh, so you get to know people because you get into a, a rhythm of knowing when your schedules line up and uh, you can create raid teams and have long-term goals that you work on doing together with mechanics and having specific fights that you have to learn, doing dances where your roles have to, you know, the healers, the tanks, and the DPS have to do their stuff correctly. So that is one kind of game that would help with community, and you're not limited to any kind of geography, because, I mean, I've had raid teams that had two of the eight members in the UK, and then four of us in Florida, and then one person in, the, in Mountain Time, and we would play at the same time every week. So, uh, you know, also the, you know, the, the kind of socialization you're describing between U.S. and Canada, too, is not relevant in a team like that. 
So you can just support each other regardless of where you are. I'm thinking about uh, the community that you build as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the group, because uh, even if you're not necessarily playing, but you're watching, sorry, but you're watching someone else play, uh, you're kind of like part of that community. And a lot of, I'm not sure if you do have a Discord or not. Sorry, don't go. <laughs> uh, but there is uh, a lot of like streamers, like big streamers that have like, you know, their own community like on Discord and, you know, they do like events and stuff. So that's how you can, I think you can find more. Um, people that you have something in common with and again like those type of communities like you speak the same language you know which is video games so it doesn't really matter like where you're from what you look like where you so kind of bouncing off of that because i think if anything i can actually relate exactly to how you feel um going back with what they were talking about it's about finding people you have a, a common thread with and kind of looking for a way to work with them on a collective um, project perhaps or even just hanging out because I would like to even say that you know in finding Lynn and a lot of the people within our comics group I would argue that because I do have a very similar personality to you I created my own community I created the community that I didn't have because I felt like an outsider I grew up in three different countries so oftentimes when I walk into a room I feel like an alien oftentimes so instead what I did was I looked for a community that I got along with and that I wanted to cultivate and they in turn kind of became the community that I was looking for all along. So to touch on both of them, because they're both absolutely accurate. Um, Discord was absolutely huge. When I started streaming, I would play Diablo by myself. And then my community started like on Twitch, people would just go and watch me and, oh, you're playing Diablo, no one really plays that anymore. Like, I'm gonna hang out. And then they would join my Discord and then they would show up with me on stream and hey I just got Diablo can we like run together I'm like oh yeah for sure and then we like discord was really such a big core for that and then when I started playing Call of Duty people you, know, you just go to Twitch and you look for whatever video game you want to watch someone play and then that streamer will typically have a discord community whether they're a big or a small streamer like I'm not saying I'm a big streamer by any means of the imagination. I think I have 2,000 followers on Twitch, and it almost happened like overnight because I had a TikTok that went viral. <laughs> so it was kind of just like luck of the hat. But um, it was slow going at first, and like you don't you don't have to go to the community that has thousands of people because it can be really really intimidating, and then you feel like you're lost in the sea, and you just want to have that sense of fitting in but you don't want to be lost in the sea. You want to actually feel like you are here with a group of people that actually see you and acknowledge you. Um, and that was huge. And then so, in your sense, I created a community because I felt like I belonged absolutely nowhere and I did not want anyone else to feel the way that I did. So that was my goal and my purpose was, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you're from. There's people that, I have people that I ran college with that were in Canada, same with Diablo in Australia. Um, I think I had some people from Germany, and even at that point, it was all through my Discord of, hey, let's run a custom game. Hey, let's do this. Or I would be Discord, or in like a Discord video, Zoom call type of a setup thing. And we would just be hanging out. Everyone would be playing their own different type of a game, but that sense of community, like we're all here in this room together, but virtually we're all doing our own thing. And you could say, hey, so-and-so, whatever, whatever, and then the conversation's right there. It's if you're all together. So Discord is huge. I created the community that I wanted to is huge, but if that's not something you want to do, there are so many communities and places out there, and it's it's very, very hard to just take that step and like essentially get yourself in the room, whether it's a virtual room or not. Um, but what's also nice about it being online in video games is it's just a username, and your picture doesn't even have to be you on your avatar. It could be a letter, it could be whatever. And it's okay just to pop in and not even say a word and just see if that is a place where you feel like you want to be. If the interactions and the conversation is a place where you're like, you know what, like these kind of seem like my type of people. So it's so easy to pop into a Twitch stream and just hang out, not even say a word and be like, nope, I don't like it. I'm out on to the next one. Or same with Discord, you're in it for a little bit and like the vibe, the energy, the feel just kind of changes. So easy just to leave and then go find another stream or another community to be a part of. And you don't just have to be a part of one community. I was very thankful that I um, became really good friends with other streamers and their communities and we kind of all brought our communities together into like one big thing. Um, but it really just takes that first baby step of, you know, I'm just going to like sit here and be quiet in the corner for a minute and discord in the stream and 
see if I like it, and then stay and hang out, start chatting, and then your username will get familiar, you'll find people and chat, and people are so much nicer on the internet than you actually think. It's only if you select few that get really highlighted and blown up on the internet or whatever that are foul. Like, I've had my fair share of them, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but the amount of people that were there to back me and support me from that one person saying a negative comment, a million to one every single time, even though I had never met my community and I'm just here playing video games. Like if I didn't even see it while I'm playing, there was a negative something in chat in my community before I could even see it, had my back nine times, like every single time. So people are a lot nicer than, than you think. Because everyone essentially is just trying to find a place that they fit into. Everyone else is just like you as well. So let's have our last question from this lady over here. Hi, I just have a question because I'm listening and it's very interesting and it's very um, educational. So would you say video could, video games could help with attachment moves as far as repairing and ruptures due to community? Like, you know, you have like an attachment move, there's a break in it, then you have this community that comes together and helps you kind of repair and attach that. this beauty now that they are creating communities. There is video games actually that they have representation of Mayan people, but the right way. Meaning like we get to play our games that we would play back in the day, that we also instead of being conquered, we actually can win and change the whole narrative, which in our generational trauma, it heals the wounds that we felt that we were not listened to. There is also, um, one is called Mazorca, and it teaches you or traditions of how to just build corn because we are people of corn. So that creates a lot of healing when you see an 80 year old man crying because they are seeing what they used to do as kids, their little grandchildren playing with. So that creates those attachments of generations that got lost because one, the kid doesn't, the grandchild doesn't understand what the grandfather did but by playing this game, now they do. So video games also help you to uh, close the gap of history, and also those gaps that we never were told in the stories that we learn in history. And Ben mentioned it earlier, right? Like when we were talking about parenting and kids, um, that's how you can, like just by sitting next to someone or like asking them about their favorite like video game, that can form that connection. Like it's just as simple as that. Like just ask, like be like, oh hey, what's your favorite video game? Because if anybody came up to you and asked you about your favorite fandom or your favorite game, you're like, sit down and let me tell you about this. And, and that creates, because your excitement is contagious. And we're like, whoa, that's exciting. Like tell me more about it. And then, you know, that's how it kind of gets started as well. And I think because a lot of games do have to deal with managing distress tolerance and conflict resolution in some games that can be brought into the real world. Hey, this per this person in your gaming party did this thing that you didn't like. How do you interact with them again? How do you talk to them about that? And then that can be brought into the real world as well. A friend of yours maybe does something you don't like. Your parents, you know, have that rupture like you said. It's, you're learning their skills through the game. So. But in, there's, I don't know the names, but I've seen streamers play this game where like, you have to work together, like in order to achieve something. So that is like even more, yeah. you know. Uh, like it takes two. I think, yeah, I think that's the one. <laughs> yes, he said. Uh, or like, you know, they're specifically like uh, working on that. But like any game really can can help. Well, thank you everybody for attending this panel and. <laughs> Say goodbye. Can anyone say where they can be found on the interwebs, or if you're going to be here at the con throughout this weekend, where can they find you? So really fast. I'm going to be here at the con throughout the weekend. You can find us. At, you can find me and my team at Small Press Booth SP36. Also, find me online, me personally at markfx411, and my team at Duwata Comics at D I W A T A K O M I K S. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at I am Herbalaria. That's I A M H E R B A L A R I A. And if you scan the code, all the information is there. Um, that's my contact like information. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> right there.
No. No, I want you to call him. Too far. Okay. I'm going to start with him. So, yeah. No, Take the phone. <laughs> okay. okay. That's like a move on. And it was a pleasure speaking in front of all of you today. Thank you for the honor. Thank you, Justin Kobe, the Scott Day. Thank you, our coach, because we're running out of time. But thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. And remember, play that favorite video game. And to find us, please just scan the QR codes. Pretty much all of us, we have one. Or oh, find us at the end of the panel. We can, we're more than happy to talk to you, even though it's a little late. Thank you for spending the night with us. Thank you.